What is up, my fellow Night Dwellers? Couchman here, and I realize the vast majority of my viewership is relatively new to modding, where you haven't modded many games or any games before. And as a result, a lot of the stuff that I talk about, at least some of the speed as far as what I do, can get a little confusing at times. So I'm basically going to be doing a little series that's breaking down some of the general information about modding games as kind of like a 101. So up first for modding 101, we're going to be talking about the different ways games are modded. Now let's go ahead and jump right into it. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the ways games normally support modding. These are actual methods that games allow for us as far as modding the games go. One is via Asset Override. Asset Override basically uses a folder or a location to find different files that share the same name as files that are in the game. It'll then take those files that are in that folder and overwrite the game files using them. Normally, this only applies to texture-style assets, but it can apply to others depending on the game. For example, Skyrim here supports asset override using the textures and meshes folder inside of your data. Basically, items you put inside these two folders will override the default values of those files. It doesn't replace them, it just overrides them, so when the game launches, it uses those textures and meshes instead of the built-in ones. So I've got the white run grounds and walls here. Let's go ahead and load the game real quick. All right, and you'll notice over on the right, you actually have the modded game textures. These are the more pretty stones versus the basic slate gray with stone. This is accomplished via the asset override. So this is basically looking at the different texture assets inside of Skyrim and replacing those with the ones that we load in via the textures and meshes inside the data folder. Now, Skyrim also has the other common way that video games support modding. That is using plugins. You'll notice these 50 per, per point ESP and BSA files. This gives you 50 perk points. There's several other ones, but this is basically using a plugin method or a DLL injection. Basically, it's a way that the game can use downloadable content to extend itself, but it also applies to modding. Now, it's not always in this format. It can be just dropped in a general file and have certain files into it that key in the game to how it works. That's the other way the game support money. It uses plugin injection, or basically it uses plugin extensions to the game. The thing to note about these plugins is by default, they can't override the base functionality of the game. That's where we have to get into some of the more complicated stuff. For instance, New Vegas, you can use your different plugins or mods to extend out the game's actual functionality, add guns to the games, all that, because those types of assets already exist. But if you want to alter the base game functionality, like add a button that lets you sprint or a button that throws grenades, you can't do that because the base game doesn't support that scripting. That's where script extenders come in. And that is unsupported modding, which we're going to jump into here in a second. For another example of how plugin modding can work, let's go ahead and take a look at Seven Days to Die. Seven Days to Die dedicates an entire folder to loading any type of plugins you want. You'll notice I've got Wastelands, Firearms, and B-dubs. In here, you'll notice they have this specific format where they have the mod info XML, which tells the game what it's going to be running for the mod. This is similar to the packages that you have over in Skyrim. However, it's different in the fact that it's just loose files coupled together by a mod info that tells the game what it's going to be loading. So this is a way that 7 Days supports plugin modding or plugin extensions to the game. So those are the two ways that video games normally support modding them as far as actually developer support for modding in video games. Now let's go ahead and talk about the ways that developers normally don't support modding but people still mod the games. We can look at 7 Days for this as well. People who want to alter the base functionality of the game or extend it or alter it in some way, they can't just put a mod folder in here. Because no matter what you do with the plugin extensions, you can never change the base functionality of the game. That's where we come to modding technique number one for unsupported modding, which is asset override. So you'll notice Seven Days Darkness Falls, you actually not only have items in your mods folder here, but you also actually replace the data files. Now by replacing the data files, you're actually altering the functionality of the game with those asset files, allowing for it to function differently. This is how you can have the backpack mods for Undead Legacy or 
inventory restrictions or altered inventory functionality. All these are done by actually doing replacement assets versus extending the game. So that's the way to generally look at it is actually overriding the game functionality, asset replacement, or some of the other unsupported methods, extending the functionality of the game, generally plugins or supported modding that way. So you'll notice the inventory is quite different as far as this goes, especially the backpack spacing. As well as your craftable items, your queue setup, everything's been modified quite a bit as far as this goes. And a lot of this functionality wouldn't be possible if we were just talking about using a base game mod. That's where the asset override comes in, is it lets you extend out, well, it lets you alter the actual functionality of the game so you can, ex it lets you alter the actual functionality of the game so you can go above and beyond what the original game intends. Asset replacement has one key disadvantage versus some other modding methods, and that is the fact that you're actually replacing the base files of the game. Whenever you're doing this, it comes down to the fact that you need to back up the game files, or you're going to have to do a complete new install whenever you don't want to play that mod anymore and you want to do something else. Asset replacement tends to be the most common way that games are modified. However, developers often don't want their games modified this way, so they try to make it a little more difficult for you. Whenever they're doing this, they package all the items into a single executable, which prevents you from having access to the data files. Skyrim, for example, is a game where everything is packaged inside the executable. You don't have access to your texture folders or your other folders inside of Skyrim. Just like that, in Dark Souls, by default, you don't have it either. That's where modding tools come that let you unpack the game and then modify it. UXM is an example of an unpacker for Dark Souls. Just like Modlunky used to rely on extracting all the files from Spelunky to allow you to mod the game and then zip them back up into the executable to be able to run. Now, this method is a little clunky since you keep on having to pack and unpack the mods to be able to progress as far as the games go. And you're actually, again, modifying the game files directly, which leads to the same issues as before, where in the event that you want to stop using your mod, you either have to have a backup or you have to uninstall. That's where the next form of modding is really helpful. This method is basically the same as asset override, except for it expands beyond just modified textures and files. This lets you asset override scripts and everything else. This you can see using Mod Engine for Dark Souls or the modern version of Modlunky, Fallout Script Extender, Stardew Modding API. All these are methods where you can inject not just texture files, but coding files into the game to expand the functionality and grant functionality that's not there. Now, depending on the developer, they may or may not support this. For instance, Dark Souls, not a fan. They will ban you if they catch you using this stuff. If you are overriding anything besides textures, they will flat out boot you offline. Just be careful there. Versus Stardew, Stardew fully supports their modding API. In fact, they often do updates just to try to extend the functionality of the modding API available. Now the modding API is made by Pathos Child and I don't believe it's the same person who creates the game. However, they are working side by side and they do put out updates together and it is fully supported with the game. So basically you have about four different modding methodologies that you'll see in most games. You have the support methods of asset overrides where the game will allow you to put items in a folder and override built-in game assets. You have the support methodology of modding via plugins where you basically have a packaged version or a specific file format that you place in a given location and are able to load it into the game. Then you have your unsupported methods of asset replacement, where you're actually taking files and putting them over the top of the game files, removing the game files as a result, and putting in the modded files instead. And the last method is basically script extenders, or basically script and asset injection, where you will put items in given folders, and you will inject not just the assets, but the actual scripting into the game to alter base functionality and beyond. Now all of these have different layers of support and you may frequently discover that certain updates will break different methodologies. 
That is the four most common ways I've encountered as far as modding video games go. This was Couch Command. You guys all have a good night, a great tomorrow, and amazing rest of the week. I'll see you next time.